Yes, I wanted to give you a short talk on um, something about our Jenkins installation that you probably all know and love, and um, how and why it kills your runaway test jobs, and um, what information you then can get out of that if it kills your beautiful um, garage change. And maybe you're even responsible for that. Most of the time, it's just these uh, flaky tests that cause the uh, uh, jobs that won't stop and need to be killed. Um, may I ask um, who of you is comfortable with um, seeing such a kill wrapper incident and uh, looking at the data and making any sense of the data that gets presented? Uh, a bit. Okay, so uh, I hope I'll enlighten the rest today. Maybe that works out and you're less scary about the, the monstrous output um, you see there. So I'll um, split this in two parts. Um, first, I give a short explanation of, of uh, what the issue is. And then in the second uh, part, uh, I'll talk about the, the information that you see there and, and how to make sense of it, maybe. Um, so yes, Jenkins, I guess, I know most of you, all of you, developers using Garrett, using our CI, using Jenkins. Um, that's good, and um, yeah, sure, Jenkins is just working wonderful for us with all these builds, ton, tens, tons of builds that it does every day. Um, we use it for Garrett. I think we use it for all the Tinder boxes by now. I don't know if there's any... No, everyone, yeah. On all platforms, of course, that we support Linux, including Android, Mac, Windows. Um, so yeah, most of it is just uh, fine weather and it works. But there's one, or th there's a couple of issues actually with, with Jenkins, of course. If you have too many, if you submit too many Gary changes, then Jenkins gets overloaded. If uh, one of the Windows or one of the Mac builders uh, as an issue and a hiccup and goes offline, then we have too few of those. Um, and then uh, Cloth needs to hit the reset button and everything is fine again. But there's one uh, intrinsic issue uh, with every kind of, of uh, the CI job running is that um, we can't solve the halting problem still. Um, so we still have the issue that we don't know if uh, your garage change will execute in finite time, um, so we have to somehow work around that. And uh, even if we could uh, solve the halting problem and we'd know that um, this uh, job would be solved in like until the end of the universe, that wouldn't help. We want to have these results quickly, so we need to have some upper limit on how long these jobs run and if they take like longer than an hour. Or what we actually uh, do implement there is that we check um, for fresh output um, on standard out or standard error. So if, if your job is still running and generating more output, and if it doesn't do for uh, a specifiable amount of, of time, then we declare it dead and uh, to be killed. And that works uh, quite reasonable and quite well. As I said, there's uh, occasional flaky uh, runs where some of the tests um, hang for whatever bad reason because there's still some, some race in the code that just hits one out of a hundred or one out of a thousand bills and then of course you experience that every once in a while. But of course you could also uh, have, a, have a change, a garage change that you wrote and that introduces something that systematically hangs and, and you would then experience that in your, in your uh, Gary changes uh, Jenkins uh, build and then would have to look into the uh, into the uh, output of the CI and, and, and see why it why it uh, hangs if you can't reproduce it locally maybe because it only hangs on Linux say if you work on on Mac or whatever. So if you if you look into a, a, a Jenkins uh, job, um, that's effectively uh, the make call that you also do on uh, for yourself in your local build environment and that make um, what I want to get at is that there's uh, 
a huge amount of, of processes uh, happening while such a job is, is going on. So the first make recursively spawns uh, make again for some reason. Um, then you have the recipes that are all executed, of course, in more or less in parallel. So you have lots of these uh, recipes being executed. Each of them has uh, these shell script lines. So you, you spawn a shell process. Um, then there's um, parentheses parts in these, uh, for example. So you you spawn another shell, then you have a JUnit test, say, that spawns a Java process. That Java process then goes on to, um, these are these remote tests where a Java process forks a, a full office and then tries to, to tell the office via you know commands what to do. Um, so the Java process spawns an S office process, that one then exacts that OO splash um, thing that shows the splash screen. Um, which we have for like historic reasons, nobody ever cleaned that up. And then that spawns the, the true as office uh, dot bin executable. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of uh, processes hanging around there. And you can imagine um, if we have a job that, that uh, stops working, so there's hung processes, then there might still be lots of these hung processes and we, might, we need to make sure that all of them Get killed. We want to get to a clean state again. Of course, we don't want to have any leftover hung processes. And I'll show you how um, the way Jenkins natively does that is not quite up to its task. Um, so we had issues with that in the past because what a test looked like, like this uh, Java test I just showed, where you have the Java process spawning the um, as office as office bin uh, thing. And these two communicate with one another via a pipe. And, um, and, and also the yes office. So whenever you start in an in, in office, it looks whether there's already another office running because we can always only have one office running per user installation. And each test has its own user installation in the work tier somewhere. But this one gets reused. So when you have two Jenkins runs, um, and there's a leftover as office process from the, from the old one, and it still has its user profile named pipe open where it listens on new connections. So, so if another as office starts for the same user installation, then it sees, oh, there's already another process that has this pipe with a special name open. Um, so I'm not going to do anything but terminate and tell the other over the pipe that it shall do. But that other is the hung job from the old, um, from the old um, Jenkins job. So it won't do anything, but you don't know. Um, so, your, so your new Jenkins job will also hang because it thinks others. Um, so in the end, the, the Java test will then tell the, the, the hung old as office to do anything, and it, it will still not do anything. So the new test gets hung as well, and your job will also get killed because there was another completely independent Jenkins job run before you that happened to get killed, but it didn't kill everything of that because Jenkins didn't know how to kill everything. Uh, and it just happened that there was an old as office process hanging around from the previous Java unit test, and now your Java unit test hangs as well. So bad luck. Um, what we needed to do then was to manually lock into those machines and kill off all the processes that still hung around, the zombie processes, which was not, not that much fun. So, um, because the issue with Jenkins is that it's written in Java, which is nice, it can run anywhere, everywhere, but the problem, of course, is that it has rather poor capabilities of how to, how to terminate um, all these processes that I showed that are, so each Jenkins job has these, like maybe thousands even of processes and, and how does it kill all of them? Well, what it did is, um, it, it, or what it does is sets a, a, a build ID environment variable to a specific value specific to this Jenkins job. And then it iterates over all the, over all the processes on the system it uh, does some yeah, PS um, equivalent on, the, on each platform and then scans the output of that, the textual output, and then looks at the PIDs and then asks for these PIDs um, whether that process has this specific 
build ID variable, uh, variable with a specific value. And if that's the case, then it knows, ah, it's one of the jobs from this process. And then it sends that job a sick term, not even a sick kill, but just a sick term, which just tells the job, please um, go away, but it doesn't kill it actually. Um, so there's tons of things that co can go wrong there, like um, new processes get spawned while it, while it processes that uh, PS output of all the processes, so it doesn't even know if there's new processes coming in and, and stuff like that. So um, when I looked into that code and, and wondered why we sometimes have these hung processes, I learned, oh yeah, that's, that's the reason and, and um, that's not, that's not going to work. Um, so what I did was just come up with a little um, C program. Um, luckily, most or most of the time, these hung jobs are on Linux because on Linux, for the um, Garrett CI, for the Garrett jobs, we run the full Mac check. On the other platforms, we don't run the full Mac check, and the full Mac check is the one which is notorious for spawning all these um, J unit and um, other Python unit, uh, UI unit um, remote tests where you have these multiple processes. So you have a Java process or a Python process that spawns an office and then tells it to do something. And these are the, the processes or the, the process groups that are most um, that are most in danger of running into this issue of, of, of hanging, uh, of having leftover um, processes when, when we killed it via the, the old original Jenkins way. Um, so I concentrated on, on Linux and created something that um, at the moment only is used on Linux. It might work on Mac, um, never tried it I think, and um, I think Noel wanted to do something for Windows at some point, but never came around with that, so we don't have anything at, for, for Windows at the moment. And um, yeah, um, condensed down, what that kill wrapper does is, um, so the Jenkins job, the Jenkins job starts with the first process, which used to be the make, that you also type in your shell when you build LibreOffice. And instead of that, as first job, we now have a, the skill wrapper program, which then invokes the make and all the processes hanging off that. But it invokes that make in a um, so-called new process group. That's a POSIX concept where you need to do some voodoo with your process and then you have a new process group. And the great thing about these process groups is that you can kill all process in that process group at once atomically and none can survive. So you can't have this issue that there's new processes being spawned while you kill the other ones. So this is a surefire way to kill all of the processes that got spawned by that one Jenkins job. And um, yeah, that works remarkably well, I think. I, I can't remember we ever ran into any issue that could be explained by some, some bug in that kill wrapper ever since, I, I guess we have like, like two or three years, I can, can't remember when. But yeah, that's kind of problem solved there. And um, we now know we can get rid of that process group, um, but we still want to know why did it hang? Was it just, again, this notorious flaky test that hangs every thousandth run? Or was it something you introduced with your Garrett change? Um, so before we kill all the processes with this one kill minus uh, group ID sick kill, which erases all, all of the stuff that was going on, um, We'd like to, to learn about the state of this hung scenario, so of all the processes that are still running and where they are hanging and why they are hanging and what's, what's going on there. So the nicest thing we could get is, of course, um, run all of this in, in some kind of virtual machine and, and if it hangs, then give that virtual machine image to a developer who can look into that, but we, we, we don't have that. So the second best thing we have is at the point where we kill, or before we kill everything, just dump as much information as we can out of the, the, the state of this process tree. Um, and that's the notorious um, large blob of, of data that when you look into the, the uh, console output of a hung 
Jenkins uh, or kill rapper killed Jenkins job then at the end of it there's a long 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 uh, blob of data and, and um, as I asked in the beginning probably most of you never look into that and I I want to explain a bit what you see there when you look into it when you dare um, open the lid and, and, and just take a peek so um, what's interesting information um, of course it's the the tree of processes that are still running with all their arguments with all their process IDs so you can get an idea of what's still hanging there um, then from the processes also their back traces to know what is what they're actually executing at or at what point they they got blocked and hanging and later we also learned it might be interesting to see the log files that are written so when you do a, a, a normal make job um, then we don't print out all the output that just, that gets generated but would only print it um, when the job uh, fails but when we kill it then it doesn't fail so it never prints anything it doesn't come around to the point where we would print the failed um, logs uh, output because we just kill it hard. Um, so we, we need to do a trick um, to find the log files and, and print them. And that works nicely on, on, on Linux as well. And that's what we do. Uh, I introduce that a bit later. Um, so yeah, that's again what we do before we terminate everything. Um, we run this little script that is supposed to generate all the data or gather all the data. Um, I did that not in the, in the C program itself because it's easier to do such things in a script. And I took Perl for no particular reason except that it is available on all these uh, Jenkins machines and it's not Python, so um, that's a little plus one there. Uh, and what it does is, or, or if, if you uh, can think of new things that we would, should add there, then it's relatively easy to do that. You just need to, to add to this. It's, uh, it's in the load repository, so you can uh, extend that script. Um, just need to make sure that it's something that's available on these uh, CentOS 7 um, build machines. So it does this PS tree thing of, of showing all the processes. Um, then for all the interesting processes, so I don't do that for the shell scripts that execute the recipes because that's uninteresting for us, but for the uh, Java and, uh, and the as office and of, as office bin processes, it uh, prints all the, the back traces, the raw ones, as well as the Python ones in case it's a Python process. So GDB has this nice uh, PyVT which looks if this process is running some Python and then it prints the Python backtraces and otherwise it just says, sorry, this is not a Python process. So that works rather nicely to, to print all the information that we can, even if it's a Python process, then you get the raw or the, the, the real Python backtraces in addition to the raw ones. And it dumps all the log files, as I said, and for that it looks into the proc uh, tree to find uh, the, the um, standard error sim links of all the processes that we are still running. Um, because that's the that's these sim links are the same as the log files, or they point to the log files that we actually write. Uh, so that's a nice way of, of gathering all the log files, because otherwise it will be hard to, to get an idea. We have these processes still running, but what are their log files? Um, so that's a trick I use there to, to gather all the, the log files that are being still open. Um, but as I said, it's uh, quite tons of data. And I already um, mentioned this in passing, so the Jenkins machines are, just, uh, are still sent or seven baselines, so they don't have some of the features that would be nice. So the PS tree command that is there, for example, doesn't have a minus T, so it shows all the threads per process with all their um, thread IDs, um, which would be suppressed with a minus T. Um, so there's even more output. And uh, I, I tried a GDB backtrace full, which also prints local variables, but I think either it was too slow in the end or it had some issues with pretty printing and Python, I can't remember, but I had to, to disable that again. And we could also try to maybe to use uh, JSTAG to print Java stacks or readable Java stacks of, of processes that are running Java. We don't do that at the moment. I can't remember whether that wasn't working on those machines or I never I never, we never, we never needed it uh, until now, but that's something one could look into, for example. Um, and with that, 
And a few minutes left. We'll go over to the real meat. So I have uh, prepared some, hope that's readable at that size, um, have prepared some rogue um, garage change that introduces some bad um, deadlocks into some test code. And of course what I then get is that the um, that the uh, Jenkins job says that it got killed by the kill wrapper. Of course, the Clang DB G util one, because that's the one that runs the make check, and I, I poisoned some of the make checks. Um, so if you daringly click on this, then it brings you to this, uh, yeah, tons of of output that you see there and especially because I had to um, make the screen size larger it, it now shows of course so um, this uh, PS tree output this tree in a rather let me see if I can if that looks that's still kind of even at that at a hundred percent it's these these lines are so long that they, that you don't nicely see um, that it's uh, that it's a tree but it prints all the all the um, process arguments for all of the processes. So it shows the makes at the tops and then the, at the top and then the shells that run the recipes. And then here we get to, to a Java that is probably a Java, um, Java unit test. And if you look at the end of the line somewhere, then it says where the, where the um, log file is getting or where the user, user installation file is. So that's this JUnit test framework complex. So that's kind of a first um, first tip for you. What what uh, process fails? So always look at the end of the lines where you see the the work dear um, directories belonging to this test, and then you have an idea. Ah, that's that's that test. Um, and then there's the yes office as office bin, and and as I said, the PS tree lacking the minus T also shows all the all the other threads per process. Um, and then we come to a second block, and there's again the shells, and um, then we see a Python somewhere. There's a Python up there, and that long line ends with the uh, UI test writer tests five. Um, so we get an idea that there's still a second test also hanging, and that's a UI test named writer tests five. And um, then the PS tree trails off. And what comes next? Is that readable at that size? So I'll leave it at that or? I think the rest is uh, not that demanding in width, so I can go a bit further. In. So um, then comes for every process that is not a shell process, um, it calls GDB on that process to uh, print all the Python and all the raw um, backtraces and also gives the registers just in case. Um, so the first one that it picks is the Java one which is completely uninteresting because it just shows you how Java is implemented and we'll have to scroll through that. So you have to look at the PID, look at the process tree to see ah that's a Java process that's uninteresting at the moment. I'll just way through that and then comes the next one which is um, a short one with just two threads and that's because it's that OO splash thing that's between the Java and the real S office bin um, so that's also uninteresting so if you see something with two short threads then it's an OO splash you scroll past that as well and the third one is then the um, first as office bin from the Java test um, and um, now you, you can, can look into that you don't see that much interesting here um, I'll give a spoiler and the issue is I think in this thread number two because from Java we do a, um, a remote binary ERP incoming request you see that here down there and that's the that's the place where I poisoned the Java test to call something in the S office, and that something in the S office is um, 
some... No, that must be another threat. This one is doing more, maybe it is the one. Yes, um, I'll hurry up. So there's, um, so we didn't find out anything about the Java test, that's an output as well. Sometimes it's too confusing to learn anything. Um, so, but we still have the other test, that was a Python one, and ta -da -da -da, here we have a Python backtrace. And Python does its backtraces the other way around. Um, I think also in this case, so the most interesting line is now the, the topmost one that says that we are in this writer tests 5x window pi file line 143. And that's exactly where I introduced that poisoning where I call uh, into the S office to do something bad. So if you then see this, you can go, aha. Uh -huh, the Python job stopped there, then I can look into the Python file and see why it stopped there and debug from there. And the Python file, um, so this is what the Python file does, here down here is how I poisoned the Python file to call not the toolkit um, you know service, but the deadlock you know service that I introduced here and, and uh, the deadlock you know service just tries to um, lock a mutex twice, which, which doesn't work, which deadlocks. So that's how I managed to um, create this uh, garage change for our testing purposes. And um, we're over the end now, so no questions, no answers. Enjoy.